you could set that up with uh, 10 and the other server up with a 20. Uh, then we have some A records. A records are fairly simple. You do your host name, in, it's an A record, so we put an A there, and then we put the IP address. We can do that again down here for www, and we have our IP address. Now, one of the things that DNS does do that we talked about before is round robin. Here we have a www again with a different IP address. So when we look up www, which IP address should we get? The DNS server will actually round robin between the two, and every time it's asked, it will give the one they did not just give before. This will give you some <coughs> type of load balancing between two systems. But keep in mind, if one of those web servers is dot three went down, the DNS server will still give out the dot three answer, even though the server's not alive. So it will load balance the two, but not completely. And also, if the web server is a session-based website where you connect and you have a lot, your a continuous session going on, continuous connection, and you're pulling a lot of data, running reports, things like that. One server may end up having a lot more sessions running on it that's taking up a lot more resources than the other. So in that sense, it's not going to load balance. It will still just round robin between the two. Uh, here we have FTP set up as a C name against www. So when you look up the FTP IP address, you'll actually get one of these two IP addresses, and that will run robin as well, because it's just converting that to a www and then doing a lookup on that. And then we have a fourth A record here, uh, Fred, with a different IP address. Now, you can have multiple host names in here, but you cannot have, or you can have duplicate host names, you cannot have duplicate IPs. That will cause you issues. Um, at one point, I believe it would let you do that, and then I think it airs out now if you try doing that, but I'm not positive. When it would let you do it, it would not complain, but it would cause issues. Why can't you do it again? You, you can't have this IP pointing to this with this hosting, and this IP with this hosting, or with that same IP as this hosting. No, you can do that. No point. Yeah. Well, right. You've got to use the C <laughs> name. No, you can have multiple. With my now you have to use the C Yes. I yeah. Unbound, it's easier. I don't have to worry about yep. Yeah. So yeah, you can't do the multiple host the same IP to multiple host names. You have to use C names in that case on bind nine. I don't know if it's different in bind ten. I don't. I, I never used ten. So. Yeah, I haven't used it either. Um, Um, so, so another record we didn't talk about is AAAA. <laughs> got, got a couple smiles there. Not sure if that's good or bad. It's good. It's good. Uh, so four A's in a row is the IPv6 address. So if your host name is pointing to an IPv6 address here, then you would put the four names. Do a question. Yes. Because everybody remember four A's means IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Four A's means IPv6. Yeah. Well, it's not IPv4. Right. <laughs> four times How the length of a 32-bit uh, What was that? 128 An A record is 32 bits. So a 4A record is 128 bits. Yeah, those are text records. Um, this is my son, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Jacob, you want to wave to the internet? <laughs> <laughs> so, I apologize for this. <laughs> Alright, so. You're getting up stage. I, I am. <laughs> you want to do this for me? Okay, so with the 
uh, reverse lookup entries. It would be your IP address uh, in QTR and then the host name. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is that for the host names, I just typed in Fred or www. How does it know to convert that to the fully qualified name of www.example.com? What, what bind does is there's no period after this name, so it automatically appends example.com to it. You could alternatively write www.example.com dot. And that final dot tells bind that the web server or that the host name is already fully qualified and do not append example.com to it. If you do forget that final dot and you do www.example.com, the DNS server will reply when you look it up with www.example.com.example.com. Who here has done that? Um, so you're <coughs> probably running a caching only name server at your house through your router. Um, it's really fun to build your own DNS server at your house. I'm personally too cheap to buy my own domain, and I kind of need one for my home office. So I've stolen home.com, and I built my <laughs> I built my own DNS server for home.com that all my stuff points to. So I don't. I, from my house, I'm incapable of going to www.home.com because it will actually redirect that to my internal www server. So I kind of like internally hijack their site. Um, it doesn't affect anyone else because no one's using my DNS server but me. But it makes it a lot easier to set up various services that require a proper, fully qualified host name. If, if, you, uh, if you don't have a uh, fully qualified yeah. Um, some of the services I'm running actually check, and if that's the case, it yells at you. Yep. <laughs> uh, the dot local BCP was obsoleted. Oh, well, thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. I Nobody cares. Answer, so I don't worry about it. But if I did, I would. Yeah, truthfully, I should just cough up the couple dollars. <laughs> I'm too you can get one for 99 cents a year now. Yeah. Go yeah, yeah, to sure. I mean, that doesn't um, cost that much. I, I really don't have an excuse for it. <laughs> but now everything's out for home.com, and I can't buy that one because someone's already using it. Um, running DNS for your own website, when you buy a domain, typically they give you a couple DNS servers to use. You can override those with your own DNS servers. And then you don't have to go to their website to update your IP address and your host names for your own web servers. You can do it on your own DNS server. So it's, if you need that extra controller, you want that extra control, it can be worth it. Um, and you're probably running DNS at work. So knowing DNS over that would be really helpful. Um, so this is the conclusion. But if I have time, how am I doing time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK. And if you go over, it's OK. Um, so if there's time, here's some security. because. Security should always be waited till the end, and only if you have time for it. If you don't have time for it, then <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, first thing is, we're going to start at the bottom of that top list. Do not run as root. Running as root is a bad idea for pretty much everything. You shouldn't even run as a root user, even if you have CU. You sue you for it. Um, CH root, who here knows what CH root is, or a jail? It's kind of like the old school Docker. If you guys know what Docker is, or containers. It's the old school way of doing it. So back in the BSD days, uh, you essentially take a directory and you say, this is actually my slash directory. This is the root directory. There's nothing below this. But you have it for a subdirectory within a subdirectory. So that way, if someone does manage, because you ran bind as root, and someone managed to take it over as root, they're now locked into this. They're now locked into this ways around. jail. Now, if they're root within a jail, yeah. within a CH root, if they're the root user, they can get out of it, which makes it imperative do not run as root. Right. Yes. Um, so, views we 
had talked about, it's essentially giving a different name to different people, depending on where they come from, or which IP they come from, which domain they come from, things like that. Uh, split DNS is another security feature. It's actually splitting, having two separate DNSs. Having one for your external view, so that when you have people coming to your web server, they access one DNS server for that purpose, and you have a separate DNS server internal. And you can actually uh, use, use to split your DNS. So you can have the ex one DNS server give one answer to the outside internet world, and a different answer to the internal world, or your internal network. Uh, it's better to actually physically split those out because you don't want your internal people having to go out to the DMZ or internet to look it up, otherwise why are you running your own DNS server? And you don't want the internet coming too far into your network to access it. Uh, so how do you set these things up? It's really, really simple. When you start DNS, when you install it, if you look at the init.d, file that actually starts it, you'll see where it starts name D. If you add dash T and then a directory, that will ch root name D when it starts up. That's all you have to do is put every, all this stuff into one directory. So instead of putting some of it in Etsy and then some of it in bar, put it both into one directory such as slash app slash name D slash Etsy and then also have slash bar in there and put all your config files in that one directory. And then do dash t slash app slash name d. And when it starts up, it will automatically ch root it for you. There is a way of doing it with the ch root command, but any flag makes it much, much simpler. <coughs> uh, doing dash u, also adding the dash u flag to the name d command on startup, and then put the name you need for it. Uh, so if you want to run it as a named D user, by default it actually starts it up as a named D user, so you're not running as root. If you compile it yourself, depending which options you do, you can change it where it will default to root. So it's something to check for if you're not doing a yum install or an app kit for it. Uh, dash C. If you're using a ch root, you do need to do a dash C. By default, it will look for the namedd.conf config file in etsy slash etsy slash named slash namedd.com. If it doesn't find it there, it will air out with a really pretty error saying, I cannot find this file in this location. Right? So if you don't make your directory structure for your stage root the exact same and do slash etsy slash named and all that, you will have an issue. So you can use dash c to point it to its new location within your ch root. So you would not say dash c slash app slash name d slash etsy slash name d .com. So you would just do dash c slash etsy slash name d .com. Are there any questions about that? Any questions in general? Where yes. Is Yes. Yes, it does accommodate IPv6. Uh, one, I left out IPv6 on here. Um, the record for IPv6 would be four A's in a row, rather than, than just a single A. So it is fully supported. Um, I actually don't know many people that are running IPv6 on their internal networks. So I don't get a whole lot of questions about IPv6. V6 and DNS in general, other than does it support it? Yeah. Any other questions? And then all the IP addresses are just IPv6 yep. addresses? Yep, you just put it in there just like an IPv6 address. It's a little more on split zone. Yeah. Okay, so a split zone is, let's say we have example.com. We have example.com in this room, and then we also have it out there on the internet. But we don't want the same answers given. We don't want the same access given between the two. We want the internet, when they look up www.example.com, 
to get 169.blah, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> Internally, we want to give it 192.168.blah. We actually, we can physically separate the two systems and have two different DNS servers. Both covering example.com and giving different information. So it's just two instances of, of it's, bind running on two different machines? It's typically two separate instances. One instance is typically running within your DMZ, and the other is running within your internal network. Yeah. It's a very basic idea. They're both but claiming to be authoritative. Exactly. Um, so you manage that by, by what the client goes to? Just the, what the internal point is? Yeah. So your external facing DNS servers, no one internal would ever point to it. It would just be the internet. Um, and you may have your other clients within the DMZ point to it, or you may not. Um, you probably don't, because when they're trying to get to the web server, you don't want them going out to the internet to come back into it. You want them just going straight across their private network. Um, so it, it's a very simple concept to physically separate the systems. But by now you can actually do it at the, at the software level. You can have two separate views for the same thing. Which essentially is what the use is. Yes. I actually, most of, I mean, I've, you know, worked with Bind in the past, but these days I work with a very active American shop and still use um, Microsoft AD DNS now. Um, normally, of course, we use DHCP, and DHCP in our environment populates DNS. Right. Um, we have a whole lot of very short duration. You know, somebody comes in with their Android device, and, you know, next thing you know, they get an address and bang, it's in the DNS. Right. Um, how does, we don't, how do we, how does the system know that it's that type of device and we want the time to live very short on that? We don't necessarily want to around or whatever. So how does it know that it's a... Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, somebody comes in, they're just in one time. It's right. in DNS and these files tend to get how does it handle things? Yeah. Yeah. Those devices scaven, don't get stuck in DNS. Well, well, so within DHCP, especially with Active Directory, Active Directory does essentially by default. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, what it will do is when it gives out a DHCP address, it'll set up a DNS record for that as well. Right. Okay. Mine is actually capable of doing that as well. Okay. It's a little more work. You have to configure DHCP to interact with DNS. I've never done that. I've looked into it. Um, it didn't look too bad. It works. Yeah, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't update yeah. the flat files on disk. It just tells the running copy of the yes. bind yes. that here's a new entry to add to your internal tables. Yep. And I think it puts a TTL on it, or when the lease expires, it'll it'll uh, remove it. Yeah. So the specific answer to your question, I'm not sure about. Mm -hmm. um, the two ways I can think of doing it are setting a TTL for a short amount of time for a particular area. Um, you can also set TTLs within for individual names so that yeah, they each, get looked up quicker. Each, uh, each record can have a TTL value on it. Right. When I've got a small pool of dynamic addresses, I just assign the names, pool that, one one pool that, one one pool that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then you'll have it set up where this subnet will have a really small TTL and this subnet's only used for this wireless network. So that it, it's a wireless network that's constantly getting refreshed because you know people are coming and going. Um, one of the things I left out of here was you can set up your zones to be updatable by another system and specify which system that is so that the entries can be updated remotely. And that's where the DNS would come into play, or I'm sorry, that's where the DHCP would come into play. The DHCP server would actually update various entries within it. Can I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, the big DHCP server is also from ISC. Yes. Same people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smart people. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. How often are there updates in DC major functions added or just pretty static in terms of what it's like? Um, so it's fairly static. Uh, by nine, there's big difference between by eight and by nine. Big difference between by nine and by ten. 
but I've waited forever for Bind 10 to come out. And I actually don't do DNS for a living anymore. And Bind 10 finally came out. <laughs> so all the cool features I was waiting for, yeah. I end up leaving my position before I had a chance to use them. Not often, but when they there are, they're major. They're really cool things. Any others? All right, thank you very thank much. You.